This video is about defensive design. So when you're designing a program, you have to make sure that they are robust. There are two critical outcomes, two real problem outcomes that could happen if they are not written robustly. Uh, the program might not function properly, might not do what it should do, um, and the program might become unsecure. The data that it holds might become compromised, and both of these things are completely unacceptable when writing programs. But there are some defensive design strategies uh, that we can uh, employ when we're actually writing our programs, and we'll have a look at some of those over the next few slides. So input sanitization, anticipating uh, misuse and input validation. Uh, authentication, maintainability of code, these are all defensive design strategies and of course testing as well. So to interact with the program users will input data um, and it's at that point that there could be a problem because it might be that the user enters some data that the program can't deal with properly um, and so that th there are some methods that we can use to prevent users from entering data that the program doesn't want. They are input sanitization and input validation. So what is input sanitization? Well, this is where data that is entered is cleaned of any unwanted characters. So when they're entering a password, it might be um, sensible to strip out any spaces so that we can't have any security threats, uh, threats from an SQL injection attack. Now, if you remember when we were looking at um, security issues we looked at SQL injections that was a few videos back now SQL stands for structured query language and when you log on to an account you will type in your username and password into a couple of input boxes and when you press enter your username and your password will be added to an SQL statement so that your credentials can be looked up on a database so here's a, an example SQL statement select account where username equals bjones and password equals password. Now what I've added to the end of this example is or wildcard, so or star. Now that there is a little bit of extra code that has been bolted on to the end of this SQL statement. And this is an example of an SQL injection attack. So for me, instead of typing in password to the password input box, I typed in password, then I typed in a um, speech mark, then space, then the word or, then space, then the world card, and then space. And what that means is that that, is gonna, that password that I entered will be added to the end of the SQL statement, meaning that I can actually start having a lot more access to the database because this SQL statement will look up where the username is B Jones and where the password is either password or anything else. In other words, I will be able to gain access to B. Jones's account. So if you had some um, input sanitization, you could strip out any spaces. Therefore, you wouldn't be able to enter the extra bit of SQL code onto the end of a password that's been inputted. Input validation is where a system will check that the input meets certain criteria to make sure that the data is in an acceptable form. So where a user signs up to an, a user account, they might be asked to put in their email address. To make sure that it is um, in the correct form, input validation might check to see whether there is an at symbol and whether it ends with a domain type. If it doesn't, yes, they could have made up any email address, but at least there's more chance that it will be a legitimate one because it would be rejected, any input will be rejected if it didn't have an at symbol or finish with a domain type. So if the entered address doesn't contain these items, it can be rejected in order to ensure that only valid data is entered by the user. So when you're writing your programs, how will you decide what, uh, what to sanitize and validate? Well, if you think about it, there are so many different combinations of inputs that users could enter into a system and to plan against every single one will be very, very difficult indeed. So what software developers use is they, they produce something called a whitelist or a blacklist to help them plan against unwanted inputs. A whitelist is a list of all the data that the program being created should accept. Everything else that is entered would be rejected. So whitelists are all the things that the program will accept. 
they could in in fact instead of creating a whitelist they might choose to make a blacklist and this list lists all the data that the program being created should reject so all other data should be accepted except for the stuff that's on the blacklist so which one is probably more effective in preventing unwanted inputs well let's have a little look when it comes to whitelist they are definitely more effective they're more secure they're really restrictive okay they often take a long time to produce because you're literally listing every single input that you will accept but at least by doing that, you know that the program cannot accept any other data that you haven't planned for. So it will be very, very um, secure, but it's often very restrictive. On the other hand, blacklists are very quick to produce. Okay, They can do that very, very quickly, um, but they don't make the system as restrictive. It's impossible to think of every possible input that could cause a threat, and therefore it's not as secure. Authentication is another defensive design strategy. So authentication is simply making sure that people have passwords to only allow certain users onto the system. And it might be that you use passwords as well to limit the access of different users to different parts of the system. So actually giving them different access rights. So security can be increased further by ensuring that users update their passwords regularly, have complex passwords and limit login attempts. Maintainability is another defensive design strategy. Now, on the face of it, it, you may not think that this is really helping um, making your program defensive because what maintainability is talking about is things like making sure that your code is written um, with nice spaces, um, indentation and so on. But if you think about it, if you write your program so that it is easily easy to make sense of, that it is very clear and very concise, then it will reduce the chance of other coders introducing coding mistakes or bugs into your program if you were to share your code with someone else so that they could perhaps develop it further. So to make source code more maintainable, programmers should write their code with the following features, with comments, indentation, and formatting. So when it comes to comments, this is where you write text which will be ignored by a translator when the when the code is being um, converted into machine code. But the, co the but the uh, text is there to um, annotate your code so that it's more understandable for the programmer or their colleagues if they're developing the code further. They should be written during the coding process and not after. And often to make things as straightforward as possible for people looking at your code, whether it's yourself when you come back to your code after a few months, or whether you're sharing your code with another colleague so they can develop it further, you'd need a program header. So at the beginning of the code, there should be a program name, the author, the date of the last edit, program description, bug fixes, and remaining issues. There should be a description about each subroutine, how it's called, and what the values are that you're being passed in and what's being returned. Any constants and variables that are declared should have a short description. And throughout the main code, you should have sufficient detail about what's going on, uh, what each sort of part of the program is doing. And again, it should just be there to allow anyone that takes your code to understand what's going on. By doing that, there's going to be a lot less chance, a reduced chance of other people introducing bugs to your program. And in that way, it's a very important defensive design. Indentation's another one. Really, really important so that it's easier to follow, easier to read. So each time you have a new code structure, for example, an if statement or a loop, we should have an indentation. Now Python forces you to indent, but not all programming languages do. So if you have an, if you're using another writing another programming language, then you should still indent to make sure it's very, very clear what's going on. So if it's clear and it's easy to read, again, someone else or yourself in a few months, if you've come gone away from your code and come back to it, you're less likely to introduce bugs and mistakes, making it much more of a robust program. And formatting, that's the last thing. Formatting is simply where you have 
space between each sort of section of your code. So if you've got perhaps um, three functions, just a little bit of space between each one will break up the code so it's easier to read. Um, a little bit like when you're writing um, an essay, you would have paragraphs to break up your, your writing. It's the same sort of thing when it comes to coding, making it easier to read, really important defense de um, design strategy.